I'm standing for this code review. That's how serious we're about to get. Heads up guys, my name is Achono. Welcome back to my code review series where you guys send me your code and I take a look at it. But today, we have a very special episode. I put up a poll recently asking you guys if you wanted to see a code review of Hazel, the game engine that I have been working on for like the last three to four years. And so, here we are. So first of all, what is Hazel? Well, Hazel is a 2D and 3D game engine. I see it more of like a 3D content creation platform. I started the Hazel project all the way back when the game engine series began, and then later branched it off into two versions. One that would remain part of the game engine series, where every single line of code that was written would be explained and showed in the form of a tutorial series. And also the big kind of 3D version of Hazel that would be developed off camera and much more traditionally as a game engine would be. Over the years, it's grown to be much more than just me working on the engine. At the moment, we have six or so people consistently working on it, two of which, Tim and Peter, are officially part of Studio Cherno, and it is their job to work on Hazel or to make content with Hazel. So it's amazing that this little project has grown into something that it has essentially formed a studio now. Hazel is still fairly early days. However, over the last year, we've made several games. We made Forest in 72 hours for Let Em Dare 50. Tim made this Space Invaders clone. And we've also got plenty of other stuff in the works. If you want to download and play the games that we've made in Hazel, you can do that right now for free. We have two games published on our itch.io page, Forest, which as I mentioned, is that Let Em Dare game that we made. And also Fragile, just a game we made in like 12 hours for fun. If you want to learn more about Hazel, and hazelengine.com is a great place to start, as well as the numerous devlogs and Hazel related videos on this channel. Now, the reason that Hazel exists and has gotten up to the stage where it is now with like paid staff is all thanks to you guys. The project is funded thanks to your support on Patreon, where you can go to get access to all of Hazel's source code, all of the games that we've made so far, and other rewards as well. So before we begin, I just want to thank you guys, the community, for making this project happen. And specifically for bringing it to this scale, because I'd probably be making a game engine on my own for free, like I was in the beginning, let's be honest. However, it certainly wouldn't be my primary job without you guys, so thank you. Alright, I'll be honest with you guys. I have absolutely no idea how I'm going to be able to do this code review. The thing is, I usually spend like an hour or so code reviewing the code that you guys send me in, which is usually just like small projects, and then I sometimes edit it down to like 30, 40 minutes. Today though, how, how like, <laughs> there's just so much stuff to review. I have a list, I had to make a list of like the key kind of points I wanted to hit today as we dive into this code review. There is a lot though, if there's anything that I haven't covered that you want to see, drop a comment below. I will very likely make follow-up videos to this. And in fact, we're going to use this code review as like a way to kick off a brand new series on my channel where we're going to go through and like fix a lot of the problems. The thing about these code review episodes is that a lot of the time I... I mention things that I would change or fix or do differently in your projects. The cool thing here is that since Hazel is my project, I actually have to go through and like, there's a lot of things I have to fix. So what I'll be doing today is noticing things that aren't right, writing them down, you know, coming up with improvements. And then we're actually going to make follow up videos where I fix those issues and show you guys what I'm doing. So I think that'll be really helpful because it'll be like a practical, you know, real world example of me implementing a lot of the stuff that I talk about. Okay. Anyway, let's dive in and take a look at Hazel. So this is what the kind of root repository looks like. I mean, we've got some like bin folders because I've already built this, but this is this is what it looks like. I want to take a minute and go through all of these things, talk about the various projects that we've got inside the Visual Studio solution as well, just so that we're initially aware of the project structure. Now, the first thing you will have to do if you actually download Hazel and try and build it is run setup.bat, which will run a series of Python scripts that will ensure that you've got everything set up correctly, you've got the right version of the Vulkan SDK, and it will also use Premake to generate the Visual Studio solution and project files. At the moment, we only officially support Windows, even though there is a working Linux build, thanks to the community. However, our intention is to, of course, support a lot of platforms in the future. So Hazel has been somewhat designed with that in mind. Now, the way that the projects are kind of structured here is we have Hazel, which is basically the core library. This is built as a static library and then used in various applications, such as Hazelnut, which is the kind of level editor you know, game creation tool. This is kind of like the equivalent of like Unity's editor or the Unreal Engine editor, that kind of thing. 
Hazelnut Launcher is a little launcher we have just to, it's kind of like Unity Hub, I guess, a very primitive version of that, that just lets us kind of, you know, see a list of projects, launch which one we want with Hazelnut. Hazel Runtime is a very important project because that is like our game's runtime. What that does is it runs like the game outside of the editor. So this is just the runtime. You give it a project, it loads that project, it loads scenes inside that project and you're off and playing. Hazel Script Core is the entire C Sharp core library of Hazel. Hazel uses C Sharp for scripting, much like Unity. Hazel Script Core contains all of like the C Sharp API that is core to Hazel. And then we have scripts, which is just like these Python scripts and vendor is like third party stuff, but it's there's also vendor folders inside the various projects. So these are just, ones that are not really specific to a project such as Premake. Now to give you guys an idea of the size of Hazel, uh, I'm gonna go into Hazel and Source. Vanda contains a bunch of third party stuff as you can see, but if we just go into Hazel Source and I run this little line of line of code count, which like lines of code aren't obviously the best metric to measure like a project size or anything. I mean, I guess it's literally measuring the size, but if we just run this, you'll get a rough idea. So we have about 76,000 lines, 76,891 lines of code, which is just C++ and C++ header files as well. Now, this is not including a lot of stuff. This is not including the editor. This is not including the launcher, the runtime, any C sharp stuff, any like shader code. This is just kind of raw C, C++ code and specifically the code that we've written as part of Hazel, not like external third party libraries or anything like that. So yeah, this is gonna be fun to code review. <laughs> So to dive into this, hazel.solution is what I've got open over here. The normal kind of startup project is hazelnut. What we can do is run that. Now I highly recommend running in release. We pretty much the whole team runs in release 90% of the time. We only switch to debug for debugging because well, like any large kind of project debug is just way too slow. So let's go ahead and run that. And here we go. Here is the hazel editor. Now all of the UI you're seeing here is rendered in real time every frame using I am GUI. It has been somewhat modified so that we can basically not have like a title bar and it kind of behaves like a normal, I guess, trendy, you know, modern Windows application. And there are like obviously a lot of features to talk about. I'm not gonna focus too much on Hazel's features here. Although we do have, if we just look at the basic panels, we have like an entity component system with properties over here. These are the various entities in the scene. We can obviously select them by clicking on them in the viewport. We have a content browser panel down here, which contains all of the assets that are used here, such as various like materials and scripts and prefabs and all of that stuff. Over here, we have a materials panel for like editing materials. There's a scene renderer panel here, which lets us kind of toggle various graphic settings. So if like, if we don't want ambient occlusion, we can turn that off, for example. We can also see various timings for how long each rendering pass takes. We have a list of shaders here that we can reload as well, which is very useful when we're working on graphics and trying to write shaders so that we can obviously just, you know, change the shader, hit reload, and we'll see the effects in real time. There's a bunch more panels over here as well that I'm not really gonna get into today. A bunch of project settings that we can uh, kind of change over here as well. If we hit play, we can obviously play the scene and we'll, you know, this is just like a little prefab sandbox with, which spawns like these cubes when you click and shoot and all that stuff. It's playing some sound as well. Some of the sound is coming from this sound graph that we have as well. If I just hit play here, you can see how we get kind of like a random sound that's being generated, you know, using this kind of visual flow situation that we've got here. And then of course we can also go file and then open like a whole bunch of different projects. Now I mentioned Hazel isn't just used for games. This project over here is another great example of what I like to use Hazel for, which is just visualizing stuff. So this scene is actually from the latest episode of my ray tracing series where I explained how like these rays actually work. And you can see we basically like set up this entire scene inside the C sharp scripting code so that we could like play around and visualize how this kind of ray tracing and ray casting actually works in 3D space which is really cool. Let's see what else there is. Okay, so there's Forest. There's Forest, which is the game that we made for Ladam Dare 50, which you can see over here. This is one of the scenes from it, the kind of initial scene here. Now, one of the most important things to know if you wanna write your own game engine is math. Without math, we wouldn't have any of these beautiful graphics here. So many things would be just so difficult to comprehend. So I always recommend that you guys brush up on your math. And for that, 
there is no better resource I can recommend other than Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. I am dead serious when I say that if you want to learn math, if you want to get better at the kind of math that you will need to build something like this, Brilliant is an amazing resource for that. I use Brilliant myself to learn new concepts and brush up on existing ones such as calculus, which is very important for like the ray tracing series, for example. Brilliant is an amazing online learning platform with heaps of courses on various STEM topics. My favorite thing about Brilliant is just how visual and engaging all of their courses are. I find that the best way for me personally to learn is visually. That's why I made that last episode of the ray tracing series where we looked at all the ray stuff visually. It's just so much easier to understand what's going on if you can see it. And not just see it, but also interact with it. And that is what Brilliant is really good at. Their courses are filled with this kind of visual interactive stuff. The best thing about Brilliant is you can get started for free. Just check out my link in the description of this video. But also Brilliant have been nice enough to offer the first 200 of my subscribers 20% off an annual membership. So go ahead, check out Brilliant. There's no reason not to. I guarantee you will come out smarter. Huge thank you to Brilliant as always for sponsoring this video. Anyway, I could talk about this kind of stuff literally all day, show you all of the features of Hazel, but that is not what we're here for today. We are here for the code. So let's dive into that. Okay, so I figured the best place to start is probably to show you guys the entry point. So let me just open like a random source file here and we'll go to the entry point. So the entry point actually is located inside this kind of header file called entrypoint.h. If you followed my game engine series, this kind of aspect of this engine is designed in the same way as the game engine series version of Hazel, which is basically we have this like entry point header file and that is included in exactly one CPP file. Specifically, it's included per application. So you can see it contains the main kind of function, which is either this kind of C style main or we have like a win main, which is used for like, you know, if you don't want the console, this is used for the distribution version of Hazel. I didn't really talk much about the configurations, but there's debug, dist and release. Debug and release is the one that we use most during development and dist is what we build for shipping. And as you can see, we have like a little macro here that enables win main for dist, but it, again, both of these just call Hazel main. The difference is just how they pass the arguments in. And this is kind of like the main loop of the application, kind of. It looks like it might be the, the main loop because we have a while application running loop here. But if you actually look at the contents of this, you can see this initializes the core, creates an application, runs the application, then deletes the application and then shuts down core. So the way that this works is this is like kind of like our main system loop. What this lets us do is restart Hazel if it needs to be restarted. And the way that we do that is we just keep this set to true. We don't set this to false. And then that way, when we close the application and it gets obviously freed from memory, we shut down core, we just loop back up and we initialize the app again. And we just start it again. This is useful if you, if you need to like restart your actual game fully for some reason, or like restart the editor. Back when we used to support OpenGL and Vulkan, this was used so that we could like restart the whole editor in OpenGL or in Vulkan. So yeah, it's pretty useful to have something like that. And we'll dive into these things in a bit more detail. But first I wanna show you where this is included. So entrypoint.h is included basically per, per project. So in Hazel Runtime, for example, we have this runtime application. We might look at this one because this is a little bit more simple. I didn't actually show, you, show this running, but if I just switch this to the startup project and run Hazel Runtime, then you can see it's just running that same prefab sandbox, but obviously as like a standalone application. So if we take a look at runtimeapplication.cpp, you can see what this does. It loads, well, by default, it will load sandbox project here or like whatever you specify in the command line arguments, it'll set up an application specification. All of this is done inside this create application function. Entry point is included, as you can see, so that is what includes that main function. And then the main function here will actually call Hazel create application. Now Hazel create application, if we take a look at the kind of declaration of that, it's just like an empty declaration with no definition inside Hazel's static library. And you can see it says here is implemented by client because this is us implementing it over here. So we kind of provide that function. We link that function in ourselves that lets us write any code we want here. And the end result needs to be like an application, which in this case is runtime application. 
a subclass of Hazel application, which calls like, you know, the base class constructor and sets a bunch of stuff up on init is called and that pushes on this runtime layer. Another example is Hazel nut, which is the editor. So what does that do? That does a, it's a bit, bit more complicated, but not really. You can see that it still has this same create application function, but this time it returns a new Hazel nut application, which is just declared and defined up here. This actually already has some Windows specific code, which needs to be addressed because we should never be writing Windows specific code in generic kind of files like this. We'll talk more about that later, but you can see it like loads, like some user preferences, you know, figures out the working directory, that kind of stuff, and then pushes on this editor layer. So, so far, both of these seem to be pushing on layers. So let's talk a little bit about the layer system. This is also actually something that's covered in the game engine series, but basically the way that the core kind of application is architected is any kind of user defined code. So for the application that you're building, if you have any kind of code that you need to run, so for example, I want to render a button as part of this interface, I want to, you know, render the scene or whatever, like these are all things that are not really specific to the core application architecture. These are all extensions of that. These are all like custom things that I'm telling my application to do and it might potentially differ per application. So all of that stuff is actually packaged up into a nice layer system. If we go back to entry point and we see what create application does, right? It returns an application and then we call app run. So what does this actually do? Well, part of creating an application is calling the application constructor. So if we go into here, we see the first real kind of Hazel class, I guess, and that is application. That is like the core of every application. You can see it's located in the core here inside Hazel, which is that core static library. And if we dive into the constructor, we can kind of take a look at the main initialization code that actually happens. A lot of this doesn't really need to be explained. I think it makes sense. I hope a very important thing that happens here is obviously creating the window because we need some kind of display, like a window to display all of this stuff. Obviously that's not really unique to any application. Every application at the moment has a window. There are scenarios in the future where we might wanna run completely headless, meaning we don't have any kind of window. We don't have any kind of real re rendering API because for example, we're trying to run a server or certain tests. So at the moment, Hazel isn't really set up for that, but that will probably need to change. We initialize the renderer. That's pretty much the first thing we do just so that we can actually start rendering frames if we need to maybe display error messages in like, you know, visually, I guess, not just in the log. If I'm GUI is being used, we create the I'm GUI layer. So I'm GUI is not something we use in the runtime. However, it is technically available. We want it to be available on LinkedIn just so that we can use it for debugging if we need to. In fact, a lot of editor systems are actually located inside the core Hazel kind of binary, the core Hazel static library, because it's very useful to be able to run those systems inside your runtime. So like a great example that doesn't really apply to Hazel because we don't support it, but let's just say we were running a Hazel game on our phones right? What if we want to have an overview of the scene hierarchy, see everything that's here, like there's supposed to be an entity, but we can't see it on the screen. Maybe it's transform is messed up. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to bring up the scene hierarchy panel like on the phone and just be like, Oh, that's what the entity transform is. It would be nice. That's why like a lot of these editor systems that you might think, Oh, scene hierarchy panel, like that's only useful for, you know, the editor, like, no, it's also useful for the runtime. And that's the great thing about using I'm GUI is that like, it's just rendered using like whatever renderer we use. So if we would be using metal, for example, on an iOS device, then you can just render your I'm GUI stuff using metal. You can access like the entire UI, which is fantastic. So that's another really huge benefit of using I'm GUI for a game engine, even as your kind of core immediate mode UI. Okay, then we initialize the scripting engine, the audio engine fonts, you know, that kind of stuff. But you can see that push layer is kind of where, where stuff happens. This is, this is what we call when we override this on init function, which by the way, is called at the very beginning of application run. So application run being called from the entry point will call on init and start the actual main application loop, which is what this while loop is over here. We'll get to that in a minute. But first layers get pushed on. And you can see that we have this kind of layer stack system. And this layer stack is what we will iterate through to update every layer. So a layer is really just a class that you can override and implement. 
that basically contains these various functions that you don't really have to implement them, but you can if you want. On attach, which is when a layer gets pushed onto the stack, detach when it gets popped off. On update gets called every frame. On I'm GUI gets called every frame, but within the context of like an I'm GUI frame so that you can add any kind of I'm GUI code that you want. On event is our event system. So for example, every time like the user clicks or presses a key or like the window gets resized, if we want, we can actually handle the event here because this the event will be dispatched into this function. And then yeah, we just have like a debug name for layers just to kind of be able to debug better. So back in application, you can see, for example, these layers being updated, whatever order they're kind of pushed onto the stack, that is the order that they'll be updated in. However, one thing that is a little bit different is the way that events are actually handled. You can see that we go backwards through the layer stack when we receive some kind of event and want to call the on event function. That's actually a really important function of the event system because you can imagine if we have two layers where maybe this kind of base layer here is like our kind of game, we have maybe like a mountain here or whatever, a little forest with like trees. This is like our game layer. However, this might be, this orange one might be like a UI layer on top of it with like a button, for example, right? So if we click on the button, we probably want the click event to hit the button first, because if it hits the button first, like we don't, we might not want to shoot in our game world because that's maybe what the left click does or interact with the world in some way. We just want it to kind of hit the button first so that we can then decide whether or not that mouse pointer was within the bounds of the button. And if so, mark that event as handled, meaning it will not propagate to like layers that are below it, which is kind of how this happens. You can see if the event has been handled, we just break out of this for loop. So that's like another little detail that's important for the event system. Okay, anyway, I think we're going a little bit too deep in, into this stuff. Uh, so if the application isn't minimized, you know, we go through all of this, we update all the layers. So you can see now why the layer system is important because layer on update can do literally everything. And in fact, it does do everything. Like layer on update will do literally everything that the application needs to do apart from render like UI, because that happens inside like, you know, on I'm GUI render, which I think will happen within like the context of a render frame. So like app render I'm GUI, you can see actually happens on the render command queue, which is something we'll get into a bit later. However, here we have rendering I'm GUI, we go through the layer stack and we call on I'm GUI render. But aside from like actual UI rendering like that, layer on update will do everything. So to give you an idea of what it does when we're actually playing a scene or we're inside the Hazel runtime, layer update will eventually go into like the scene on update function, which will like call all of the C sharp scripts on update functions. It will simulate all of the physics. It will submit all of the entities to the renderer for rendering. It does like literally everything. This is like really the, the heart of this entire application. Now getting into editor layer, this is a really big file. Like if we scroll down, it's what's about 3000 lines of code. It's not, not huge, but it's definitely not small. This is basically the entire level editor. Now, if we take a look at what else is in Hazelnut, like there are, you know, a bunch of panels here. These panels are specific to just Hazelnut because obviously we can't use them inside just the, the, the runtime because they're actually inside this module. We also have that sandbox project that we were looking at. This kind of ships with the engine as like an example project. But of course you can make your own projects as we've done for like every game, just file new project. Now I want to quickly mention that like a lot of people would look at this file being 3000 lines and say like this, that's terrible design. Why is it all kind of in one file? And my answer to that is just, just no, just, just don't say that because the thing is like, I firmly believe that having large files is, is a good thing. Like it really, it's really hard to say that because it depends on like the use case, right? Um, and it depends what your code is doing. But the, the thing is when you're working with a game engine, when you're working with something that genuinely is complicated, there's just no way around having large files. Like, I mean, yes, you could break it up into small files, but why? For the sake of breaking it up into small files? Like that doesn't make any sense. If everything is nicely in this file, look how easy it is to just deal with everything. I can collapse all these functions. I can easily see everything that's here. I can control F, I can find stuff that I'm looking for because I know it's going to be in this file. If I wanted to, I could have like certain definitions or like static variables, static kind of private, you know, functions within this translation unit within all this file and everything would be great. It's faster to compile because it's all in one file. We don't have to like look up a billion files. It's great. And I'm not saying you should put your whole engine into a file. That doesn't make any sense. 
I'm just saying that if you see your files getting large and you're like, oh, maybe I should split that up into another file, really ask yourself why. Why are you saying that? Like there's nothing wrong with having a large file. Maybe if it's like 20,000 lines of code and like the syntax highlighting is struggling and your whole IDE is slow or whatever, for whatever reason, maybe that could be a good reason to maybe split it up. But like in general, I just love having all of this stuff in one file. Another great example of us having a lot of things in one file is the script glue class. This is the entire kind of binding between C++ and the C Sharp scripting engine. If we collapse that and we take a look at it, like this is also like 6,000 lines of code, but you can see we've got like regions here everywhere. Everything is nicely kind of separated um, and defined, right? We can search through everything. I actually mentioned this on a live stream like yesterday that the other good thing about having this all in one file is when you're, look, when you're trying to implement like a new binding between C++ and C Sharp and you're trying to find an example of it already working, right? Because you're, you, for example, have no idea how to marshal an array between like C Sharp and C++. Well, if all of the C Sharp binding code is here, it's just so easy to find. Right? You don't have to start looking through the files and be like, oh no, like all these C-sharp bindings are in like literally each class that they bind with. Like that's terrible. Having them all here is just amazing and it just makes the workflow so much easier and so much nicer to deal with. So yeah, in terms of large files, like large files are kind of in inevitable when you look at a project like this and the people who like are concerned about certain functions being too long or certain files being too large. Like there are better things to be concerned about. I'll just put it that way. Okay, so because our time is somewhat short, let's dive into a specific function here. So edit a layer on update is a, is a good one because what this will eventually do, obviously as you saw in that level editor, is it will render our scene and it will potentially also update our scene if we're in play mode and simulate physics and do all of that kind of stuff. So how does that work? Well, we have several scene states, scene state edit, scene state play, simulate, pause, you know, all of that stuff. And based on the current scene state, this does different things. Now, the main kind of meat of this is edit a scene on update editor and on render editor, as well as in play mode, we have, uh, if, if we're not using editor camera, we have a runtime scene, which is a different copy of the scene that we uh, basically will update on update runtime and also on render runtime. Now, why do we have two versions of the scene? Well, the reason for that is when we hit play, what we do is we copy the whole scene. So you can see we create a brand new runtime scene and we copy the editor scene to the runtime scene. Why? Because obviously we're going to like have to destroy the scene in, in the sense of like, we potentially need to spawn a bunch of entities. We need to, you know, move the player around the map. We need to simulate physics, which will move all of them. And then when we hit stop, we obviously wanted to return back to what it was. And so the easy way of doing that is, well, just make a new scene, copy that scene. And then you can have your kind of mutable scene, which you can change and do whatever you want to. And as soon as you, you hit stop, you basically delete that scene that you were playing and then you go back to just kind of rendering and displaying and interacting with your editor scene. So that's kind of how that works. An editor scene is what gets saved when you hit control S, obviously. That's kind of like your main scene that you're editing. Obviously the runtime, Hazel runtime, doesn't actually have two scenes like this, but uh, the editor, for, the, for the editor, it's, it's great. So editor scene on update editor and on render editor. It's kind of similar to the runtime. We might look at the runtime because it's a bit more interesting, but on update runtime, inside the scene file is kind of what does all of the all the main kind of update work. Now this scene is a major system. We have a little folder for it even called scene. Um, I don't know, there's so much stuff. Like I don't know if we'll get to all of this stuff. I have a feeling I might have to make a follow up video just talking about like the renderer because that's obviously like a major system. But anyway, so in the scene, the scene is also big, right? Two and a half thousand lines of code. This is also kind of a, an important class, obviously, as you can imagine. So scene update and render are the kind of big ones. Why do we have two separate updates and, and, um, and renders because they do different things. Like we could do a better job for sure of like combining some of these things. So if you look at on render runtime and on render editor, a lot of these things are similar. Like for example, the way that we render the lighting is identical. Um, it's just that I think the, the really, to be honest, the major difference is probably just the camera. So we use an editor camera for on render editor um, and, and for simulation as well. But then to render runtime, we obviously use like whatever entity in the scene has 
like a camera and it's also the primary camera. So that's what we kind of render from, right? So that that's really the only difference. I mean, there's some other, you know, setup code that's specific to like this camera entity that obviously doesn't exist. But aside from that, we probably should combine the functions because they are, they are similar. And the way that it currently sits means that we have to, any changes we basically make to the rendering inside scene, we then have to also make to simulation and runtime, which is just asking for bugs. So that can definitely be improved. But the update is quite different because on update editor, you can see it really just updates the animation so that we can like still play like our kind of skeletal animations uh, in kind of the uh, scene view. However, um, on update runtime is, you can see it's, it's huge. It does so much stuff. Um, so let's kind of begin with the top. So the first thing we do is we update box 2D. So, and this is what, when we hit play, this is when we're actually playing like a scene in Hazel. So updating box 2D, obviously important uh, if you have 2D physics. If you don't, like this is another thing, right? Most 3D games that we've made, in fact, every 3D game that we've made and shipped does not actually have box 2D. Like we don't actually use box 2D for anything. Yet we are still at the beginning of every update being like, hey man, do you have box 2D world components? And like, let's make sure we update that. You know, that's obviously useless because there's not gonna be any bodies any box 2D bodies within that box 2D world. Even though, yes, the world will exist technically because the scene always creates it. That's something that definitely does not need to exist, right? So we could probably scrap this. Um, this as well just won't run really. This for loop won't run because when you ask the entity component system for like all of the rigid body 2D components, you'll get zero if it's a 3D scene. Well, I, again, there's nothing, just to point this out, you can definitely combine 2D and 3D physics in one scene. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. That might be useful in some cases. I'm not saying this doesn't need to exist. I'm just saying that if, you know, for the 3D games we've made, we haven't used 2D physics for anything within those 3D scenes. And so because of that, this is something that we could exclude. In fact, if we were really being pedantic about this, we probably don't want to link box 2D in to the engine at all, right? We probably want to not compile with that because when we ship our game and we look at like the EXE file, this all builds statically. So it'll all be built into like a single exe file, all of these things, no DLLs really for anything except for mono and I think asimp as well for like 3D models and stuff. But basically because all this stuff is built not with DLLs, like it will mean that the binary size grows a bit. I mean like the binary size isn't that large. If we take a look at a game such as like forest, for example, if we look at the actual forest exe, so this is kind of the build result, right? Everything gets built into forest.exe, which here you can see is like eight megabytes. So it's not massive. And then we just have these two DLLs, which are kind of like the dependencies that are not statically compiled. So in other words, we have about 25 megabytes of total binaries that are necessary for this actual application. So not too bad at this stage. As the engine grows though, I'm sure it will be It'll be, it'll get larger. Anyway, moving on from box 2D, we then have the actual physics scene and this is the 3D physics scene. So for physics, we use NVIDIA PhysX uh, at the moment. That's kind of like our physics backend. We call physics scene simulate. We have our own kind of API on top of that, which again is something that we might explore in like a later video. You can see it's in the physics folder here. We have 2D, which is kind of box 2D. And then we have uh, the 3D, which is like PhysX stuff. So this is all of our API on top of PhysX to kind of manage everything. Um, so yeah, lots of stuff obviously here, uh, but physics scene simulate will eventually like call into PhysX and actually update it. So you can see there's an advanced function over here. And then we do PhysX scene simulate, which is already going into like NVIDIA PhysX stuff and simulating our scene. This function will also kind of re-synchronize any transforms. So once PhysX actually simulates the scene, it moves entities and all of that within the scene. It's just moving a transform and then we have to take back that transform and apply it to the entity. So that will take care of all of that. The next kind of stage here is updating all of our C Sharp scripts. So games in Hazel are written in C Sharp, just like in Unity. So we obviously have to go through and call the on kind of on update function on every entity, which is what this will do over here. Every single entity in the scene that has uh, basically that script component and has an entity instance here, it will uh, it'll call the on update function. And then there are certain things that we can't do in the middle of an update. So we submit them to a post update queue. That's This comes from C Sharp. So any submissions from C Sharp will get processed kind of after all of the entities have finished updating, which is what happens here. Animation gets updated. Audio over here gets updated as well. This is, this is all still like audio stuff. We have quite an advanced audio system, if you haven't noticed by that graph earlier. And that's kind of it, 
that's everything that happens as part of the update. Now, render, if we take a look at render runtime, that is over here, that does all of the rendering. Now, you may have noticed that uh, these are basically called sequentially. So we have like on update runtime and then on render runtime, right? These are called all from the same place. Now, rendering doesn't, actual rendering stuff doesn't actually happen immediately. Rather, it gets submitted to a render command queue, which ideally would be processed on a separate render thread which is the architecture that I've designed Hazel to work with from the beginning, or it could still run in a single threaded mode as it does at the moment. And it could just go through that render command queue on the main thread, but like after all of the updating, which is how it currently works. So in other words, like Vulkan draw calls and all of that stuff won't actually happen inside this function. They'll happen later. Inside application.cpp, we have a render or wait and render function, which again, ideally would run on a separate thread and we will move to that architecture. I'll probably make videos talking about how we move to that architecture because it's coming very soon. But basically this will go through the render command queue, which is actually a custom command queue that I've written here. The main reason for this is to make sure it doesn't allocate memory. It allocates the entire like 10 megabyte buffer in this case up front. That's hard coded, which probably isn't the best idea. It probably needs to be able to resize and everything. But uh, this will kind of pre-allocate 10 megabytes worth of commands, which are basically function pointers, as well as any data that you copy as part of your function. And then that gets kind of executed here just by going through all the commands and finding like the point to the function as well as the kind of parameters and executing the function over here. So that that will happen over here, even though currently we are inside layer on update. Now back in on render runtime, you can see we yeah do stuff like set the camera viewport size, we go through and kind of construct this little light environment, which is contains some information about directional lights. We really only support one directional light at the moment. So that's what we're kind of seeing here. Point lights, however, we support like, well, a lot, we use forward plus rendering. So uh, we can have like a million of them probably. Um, but I think realistically the hard limits that are just put in the shader at the moment is 1024 point lights, which we haven't need to, needed to really exceed. But again, we could have as many as we want. All of the point light data can just be stored in the storage buffer that you can resize to be as, as big as you want. So uh, that's, that's kind of how it works here. We have a bunch of point lights, which are just entities which have a point light component. We'll go through them and just set them up into the light environment. And yeah, I think this is over here. Well, this is, this is actually a vector, but in the shader, I think it's, it's set to be like 1024. We have a sky light at the moment, which is really just like a, an environment map. So we use this for image based lighting in our rendering. So that's us kind of finding it here. And if we don't have one, we just create like a black one. This is necessary just so that we can send it to the shader and we have like data to read from. Otherwise, what this is doing is basically either generating a dynamic sky. So we have like a dynamic sky compute shader using like the Prethem sky model. So we can set up a bunch of parameters and it will actually create one. That's what's happening here. It's kind of like a memory only asset that will get created by your game at runtime if you're using that. Otherwise you can read in like an HDR equi rectangular map, which are basically like the kinds you'd find on like polyhaven.com slash HDRI. So see this kind of equi rectangular format. You can download any of these in this kind of format and just slap them into your to your skylight component basically. So that's that. And then we finally do renderer begin scene, which is kind of the beginning of the scene renderer, which is the class that renders all of our stuff, which is also 3000 lines of code. And <laughs> I'm telling you this code review, man. So I think scene renderer, we will probably save for a different day, probably make a video just talking about the rendering in Hazel. Uh, because basically scene will call into scene renderer and scene renderer will then call into like a static renderer class. Uh, and then that will actually execute like the Vulkan render API commands and all that stuff and submit them to that render command queue. So that's a, that's a rather big system in and of itself. So once we've called begin scene, which just gives us kind of like some context, uh, then we render all of the static meshes, we render all of the dynamic meshes, and then like, you know, physics debugging you know, visualization and all that stuff if we need to as well. We then composite in any 2D rendering on top of that. So you can see we get like the final pass image. We set that as like the target render pass and then we go into there and, you know, draw any sprites which are currently disabled um, as well as like, you know, text rendering um, in 3D space. So this is if you have like a text component basically. I think you guys saw in that prefab sandbox scene there was like some explanation text. So all that would be rendered here. Uh, any debug rendering that we've done from C sharp as well will kind of show up here. And that's kind of it. That's the end of that function. Now there's obviously like so much more like stuff we could look at here, 
Um, but I'm beginning to think this might be a good natural place to kind of end this first video that shows kind of an overview of how the engine comes together, how the application loop works, how the scene like update and rendering works as well. From here, I think the next thing we'll look at in a separate video will be specifically like the renderer because I'm sure that a lot of you are interested in how all the rendering works and how it comes together. So we'll definitely take a look at that. I think I'll also make a video talking about the performance of Hazel. So we'll bring up some of the tools we use for profiling and see like the problem areas that need to be improved and then we'll actually see if we can improve them. I've also got a long list of things that need to be like fixed, re-architected, refactored, re-implemented, whatever. And my idea is hopefully to show that happening in the form of like this series, basically. I just don't think there's much point in me showing you all those problem areas now. It's probably better to like focus on each area per video or something like that. Anyway, let me know what your thoughts are regarding something like this. This is obviously like a huge project and it's difficult to kind of code review and go through everything here. So hopefully this was somewhat entertaining and informative to you guys. If there are any other engine systems you want me to kind of extensively talk about as well, then definitely drop a comment below and let me know. As I've mentioned, feel free to play some of the games that we've made in Hazel for free. I'll leave links below. And if you want to support the project and get access to all of this source code and the entirety of Hazel, then patreon.com slash the is where you can go for that. If you have an interesting project that you want me to take a look at as part of this code review series, then email me at churnoreview at gmail.com. I'll have like some details in the description box below. But other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to check out Brilliant using my link in the description below as well. And I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.